Welcome to the 2021 New York State World Languages Professional Learning Series. My name is Candace Black and I am your World Language Associate in the Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages of the New York State Education Department. We'd like to welcome you to Understanding Unit Planning with the Revised New York State World Language Standards Part 3, Checkpoint D with Lisa Shepard. In this session, you will learn how to use backward design to prepare a unit for learners at the Checkpoint D level. You'll see examples of how the New York State World Language Standards can be used to define student outcomes and how these standards can be assessed using an integrated performance assessment. Lastly, you'll come away with a variety of tasks that can be used to plan learning experiences for your students in the interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational modes, as well as to increase their intercultural competence. Let's review a few housekeeping details before we get started. We have over 400 pre-registered attendees today, so we ask that you remain muted and that you reserve the use of the chat for questions for the presenter or for when the presenter specifically instructs participants to use this feature. If you accidentally get disconnected, just reconnect or call me and I will assist you. My cell phone number is on the confirmation email I sent you yesterday. We've entered the link to the handouts folder in the chat. This will be continued to be entered into the chat throughout the workshop and will also be sent to you following this workshop. In the chat or in the folder, you'll find the revised standards, themes and topics, proficiency targets and performance indicators, crosswalk, as well as a unit planning template catered to the revised standards. The PDF of the presentation will also be added to this folder, but at the end of the workshop. Within 24 hours of this event, those who attend the workshop will receive either a certificate of attendance or a certificate documenting CTLE credit. The type of certificate you'll be receiving was indicated in the confirmation email you received after you registered. This workshop is being recorded. The video will be uploaded to the World Languages Professional Learning website within about a week of this event. Those who are unable to attend this live webinar will be able to earn CTLE credit by viewing the video and answering seven out of 10 questions on a post-assessment correctly. Before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to thank the following individuals for their help in assisting with this workshop. Alicia Barinas, Kimberly Harder, Luisa Mota, Barbara Patterson, Aris Thompson, and Yun Chao Zhang. Our workshop presenter today is Lisa Shepard. Lisa is an independent consultant who spent the first 29 years of her career teaching French at the secondary level. During that time, she earned her national board certification, was chosen as the Ohio World Language Teacher of the Year in 2016, and began publishing her blog, Madame's Musings. She is now using her experience with standards-based unit design and proficiency-based instruction to provide professional development to world language teachers around the country. Lisa is also a hashtag LangChat moderator and a frequent presenter at local, state, regional, and national conferences. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite Lisa to begin this workshop. Hello, it's great to see you all. Can you hear me okay? Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be with you. So as Candy mentioned, we're here to talk about unit planning part three with our checkpoint B learners. I have got lots to say, lots to share with you. So I'm going to get right into it. Um, of course, we're going to start with today's goals, what they are for today. So we have first that we want to um, we, that I can curate appropriate authentic resources for Checkpoint B learners. I can design interpretive tasks for Checkpoint B learners. I can design interpersonal tasks for Checkpoint B learners. And I can design presentational tasks for Check B learners. And those are what, that's what we're gonna be working on today. So it's our mission, right? You've done all of this work so far in your professional development um, and get, we're getting ready for our mission. Our mission is to be able to plan that unit for those, for our Check Bs. 
So before we kind of start on our mission, we want to pack our bags a little bit with what you've already been working on. So we always want to start with that end in mind. So we have our, these are the can do statements that I created for kind of the sample unit that I'm going to use as we talk about different types of tasks. So for our um, interpretive can do, I have, I can analyze and interpret simple sentences and short informational texts about social media in, fr in francophone culture. So the, so this unit sample unit that um, all the activities I'm going to show you today are going to be based on that theme of um, social media because I think that's a pretty popular one with our students. For our interpersonal task, I can give in, I can ask for and give advice about social media using by creating simple sentences and asking appropriate follow-up questions and conversations. And just as a um, um, a reminder, I'm, I use intermediate low when creating the uh, can do statements for this unit, but of course our checkpoint B learners are also going to be either um, can also be at the intermediate mid level. Um, and the activities that we look at today are going to be appropriate for both. Um, so then for our presentational, I can give opinions and advice about social media by creating simple sentences. Our cultural first cultural is um, I can describe cultural products and practices related to social media in my own and other cultures to help me understand perspectives. And lastly, I can describe comparisons of social media practices um, and products of the target cultures with, with those of my own culture using sentences. So those are our can do's. And then, of course, the other thing we need to have packed in our bag before we start our mission is that um, the end in mind that summative assessment that our students are going to be ready for as a result of the work that we do with them in this unit. So um, the context of the IPA that I had in mind for this unit is that the school where you are an exchange student, so this is what the students would have, this, the school where you are an exchange student has been having problems with hacking, hacking and cyberbullying. First, you'll read an infographic um, uh, to help you learn about how these problems can be reduced. Then you and a friend will discuss how you can improve your online safety. And finally, you'll, you will write an article for the school newspaper with suggestions for your classmates. So, and then, later when you have your own copy of this and I'm going to share a link with you at the end but you could click there if you want to actually see the entire IPA that I designed for this unit. All right so the last thing that we need to kind of pack before we start on our mission of creating the unit is um, some authentic resources. So I think for students at this check B level, checkpoint B level, I think some great um, types of authentic resources are infographics, um, other very visual texts, articles, either online or print articles, social media posts can be great, blogs and vlogs, song lyrics, music videos, other short videos, commercials, public services announcements. We're going to look at examples of how you could use all of those um, with your students today. So of just a few suggestions for your, whoa, I got ahead of myself a little bit there. Just a few suggestions for curating those resources are that you wanna make sure that you include resources from a variety of target cultures. If you teach a language that has uh, more than one culture or country or area that speaks your language, resources that are really rich in that cultural content. You wanna use filters like on YouTube, there's a filter that you can select videos that are less than four minutes. So that's gonna be really key. Um, and um, just use, use our target language in our search to do our Google search and also to follow great um, other language teachers on Pinterest because they can curate some, they're already curating great resources for you. So some examples of what those um, would might be great authentic resources for this unit for French students at Checkpoint B um, are these infographics and you can see I've tried to curate ones that use different from different cultures. So that first one is this first one on the left is social media in Quebec and the middle one is use of smartphones in Madagascar and then the on the third one is young people in social media and that's in France. So just focusing to make sure that we're covering different francophone cultures some other ideas of some highly visual um, texts that have those simple sentences that we're looking for with our intermediate lows. Um, so a little bit of combined sentences here for also for our um, 
or intermediate mid. So the first was just a kind of like an infographic about what you can do to kind of hang up your smartphone to get away from that a little bit. The second one is a little test from a magazine. Can you live without your cell phone? And the third was just kind of a fun thing. It says social media explained with French fries. So that's pretty cute. So then of course we want to have lots of video resources too. So for this unit, a few that I brought in were the, on the left there is a song called Mon Précieux by Soprano. Um, and there's just a little screenshot from his music video. The second one, Réseau Sociaux is a cartoon about um, why people get addicted to um, social media. And the third is a news show about why people get addicted or about how people are addicted to their social media. Of course, we can also use social media posts with our students, and I like using those because they're so searchable. So in this case, I, I just compiled some tweets, and I just, in the search bar on Twitter, if you're less familiar with it, in the search bar, I just put the, um, I just put the phrase, Facebook and nul, so, um, Facebook and nul. So I um, found different tweets that had that, and that means Facebook is useless. And then song lyrics are great. A lot of times students can't, it's pretty hard to understand just from listening to a song, but in this case, um, you know, we could like to give them the lyrics and then they can start to read those. And of course we want to listen too. So our bags are packed. We have our can-do statements, we have our IPA, we have our authentic resources, and off we go to complete our mission. And that first mission is to assemble interpretive tasks. So we have all these great authentic resources. What are we going to do with our students so that they interpret those? How are we gonna guide them in interpreting those? So just as a quick reminder, interpretation is interpreting what the author, speaker, or producer wants the receiver of the message to understand. It's one way, right? We can't negotiate meaning. It's a processing not only um, of just the literal message, but also reading between the lines to make inferences. And that's so important, right? Because this is how our students are learning about the culture. So lots of different tasks that, I could, that we can use with our students to, to interpret these authentic resources. One that I, that I like to use a lot is um, a true-false, true-false with justification, I call it. So the students would answer true-false, and I'll show you an example. So there would be true-false sentences, and you can see this is the text I use on the left. And to kind of show you how these slides are gonna be set up, below is a link to where the text came from. And then over here, you can see a link to um, this actual, the actual activity I've, I've shown. I've um, done a screenshot of the activity to, so that we have something to look at on the slide. But if you wanted to see the whole activity, then you could. So um, then, so how this looks is that um, there's this sentence right here. So it says the majority of French people communicate with their cell phone before communicating with their family in the morning. So I marked that that was the true. This is the key that we're looking at. So we marked that it's true. And then, um, so then you have to justify that with a fact from the text. So for 61% of French people, their cell phone and their tablet are the first people things that they consult as they wake up. So that would be a true statement. And I would have as an advice if you're using this to try not to um, use the same language in your sentence as you do, um, as that you would find in the text. And, and that would be an example of that. So the next um, one is a graphic organizer, and I like to use a lot of graphic organizers as interpretive tasks. For one reason, I feel that that really helps the students um, to personalize the information. It's not just a right or wrong answer. And also for the teacher, this is a lot less work for you on this end, right? Um, you can have most graphic organizers, you can have blank ones and the students ready to go. And then for that can be used for lots of different text types. So this one, window notes, I'll show you what it looks like here. 
This window notes is kind of looks like a little window. On the left, you see the text that I used. So the students are going to fill out facts. So this check marks are just facts from the text. Um, so a fact from that text is that half of the, po the world population is registered on the social media. Facebook has two, um, two billion users per month. Uh, in France, there are laws of, uh, again, there are laws on freedom of expression. So those are facts. Um, and on the other, so then on the right, we have feelings. And I'm sad because social media, people on social media can put online anything they want. I'm happy because it's forbidden to publish messages about hate and violence. So those could be feelings that the students would write. Then questions, why isn't Snapchat more popular? Um, and then connections. Um, I'm, in, I'm registered for social media. I share photos. So this is just a very simple graphic organizer, but this, it really allows the students to per personalize what they're reading about and make connections with that text. So another uh, interpretive task that we could use is called Cuss and Discuss. It's kind of fun for a title. So it just stands for C is to um, circle new words in a text. So it's just a way of annotating a text, right? U is underline details to support the main idea, main idea, and then a star next to the main idea. So in this case, this particular um, text, the main idea was the, tub, the subject of it or the title of it, Snapchat and Instagram generate anxiety and depression among young people. So I starred that main idea. Then I underlined some details that support that, as you can see. And then I drew a circle. In this case, it was a rectangle because of the software I was using to do that, the program I was using, but then some just some words the students might not know. And then it, as a follow up to that, of course, the students can discuss what they um, what they circled, what they starred and what they underlined. So for songs, what I, I like this activity, I just call it find the verse, but um, it says that, the, so I'll show you an example, looks better. I kind of put directions just in case you're looking at this later and I'm not here, but in the most case, uh, I think for the most part, it's best if I just showed, show you an example. So because um, song lyrics are like poetry, they can be kind of tricky for students, right? Because they have a lot of that figurative language or poetic language. So for this activity, what the students do is I, gave, I give them a very literal, phrase and the students find the verse from the sentence so this one I thought you know this sentence this particular song was really good up for that plus it's all about the use of social media so the literal sentence I gave them are his cell phone um, distracts him when he's driving so that's a sentence it's true but what is the verse where we where we find that out so the verse was um, of course it's written in French here but in the car my eyes are in your so a few red lights I run. So we really have that, um, you know, that really practice with that figurative language, that poetic word order. And the students really are showing that they understand that song to be able to relate that to, um, to be able to relate that verse to the literal meaning of it. So trouble getting on my button. Okay, thinking hats. I use this one a lot with my students. Um, and this is really great for using different perspectives. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like. There's a sample article. And for this activity, the students are divided into groups. And each group is assigned a different colored hat. And the hat just stands in for the perspective or point of view that they will use when interpreting the text and also later when they discuss the text. So the white hat is all about facts. So, you know, in the, if you have four or five students in a group, I mean, there's five different hats. You might not have one student for each color every time. You might not have a multiple of five. But whoever is assigned that white hat, they are going to note the facts from the text. So in this case, a fact is that one student um, or a person is a victim of cyberbullying if they have repeated attention, unwanted attention online. Uh, that would be an example of a fact. Now, the red hat is 
is emotions. So that's the color of emotion. So an emotion could be, it isn't fair that women are more likely to be victims of cyberbullying than men. Uh, a gray hat is more is when you kind of identify problems that are in the text or also, also to encourage the students to do um, you know, problems, their own negative judgments that they feel as they're reading it. So a negative could be women, uh, single women are more likely to be bullied than, you know, um, married women. Uh, mental health of victim, victims of cyber, ballet, cyber bullying isn't, you know, isn't as good. So those are, that would be a problems. Positive information is that 75% of victims of cyber bullying um, are confident about their safety. And then the last part is solutions, alternatives. It's the green hat. And I put a question here, but that could also be something you could put there. But I put, um, why do victims of cyberbullying, um, why are they, whoops, sorry, I skipped too far. So why are they satisfied with their personal security? I thought, I just kind of thought that was a strange information to have in there. So that would be um, a, a way to do, get, students to think about what they're reading with different perspectives. And then often I would follow that up with an interpersonal task where the students um, where the students discuss what they wrote and they would keep that hat on or keep that point of view as they were discussing and it makes for a really rich discussion of the text afterwards. Uh, another activity that's an interpretive task but leads to a great interpersonal task is Cornell Notes. If you're not familiar with those, we'll look at it, what it looks like. So it's just a kind of note-taking graphic organizer. And I have the students start with this notes side. So they just take notes on the text. In this case, the text was an article about um, a day, the day without a cell phone. So uh, a few facts were nine out of 10 French people have a cell phone. Phil Marceau created the day without a cell phone. The idea was to encourage people to turn off their cell phone for 24 hours. French people spend two and a half hours on their phone each day. So those are some facts. And then the students write a summary on the bottom. There's a summary. But what I really like about this activity is that on the left side over here, the graphic organizer asks the students to write questions. I know when I was studying, I really like to write myself questions because answering those questions would, would be how I learned the content. But also what I love about it is that now that the students have written these questions, when it comes time to discuss what they've written, they already have the discussion questions written. And I encourage the students to have questions either that are answered in the text or just things that occurred to them as they were reading. So the teacher doesn't even have to prepare the discussion questions for this one. They are ready to go. Another um, graphic organizer that was kind of new to me when I started doing some research for my ACPO presentation for last, last week, I guess it was just last week, is this windows and mirrors that um, graphic organizer. So for this, the students in this case, it was a video that I did, but of course it would work great with a written resource too. But the students um, pick main ideas out of what they interpret and they, they fill in these ideas in either the window, and it goes in the window if this idea is, is wi a window to the culture, to the other culture that you have read about, or the mirror if it's a fact that's reflecting your own experience. So in this, these examples, this, the, there was a girl named Leticia in the news video. So she uses the public transportation app to plan her route on the subway. So that might be a window because maybe my students don't have, don't use public transportation. Um, the average French kid gets her first cell phone at age 11. So that may or may not reflect my experience. But then on the right side, we ha I have some things that might reflect their, their own experiences, such as Leticia surfs on her phone all day long and that one of the guys um, uses the alarm on his phone to wake him up. So again, this is really great for personalizing the text for students because you know, their information could go uh, on either side depending on their own experience. Um, another uh, great activity for critical thinking is claim evidence and reasoning. So we'll look at that. Um, so for this one, I have the students 
um, I give a question and the students make a claim about it. So my question is, who is more addicted to their smartphone, Americans or French people? And I picked that because this, this particular, I would give both texts. There's an infographic about Americans and their cell phones, and then also one about some ways that French people use their cell phones. So um, you could have them make a claim. I just gave them a choice of claims for this one either. Americans are more addicted or French people are more addicted. And then in the evidence part, the students just write evidence, write facts from the self, from the infographics to support whichever claim they picked. And then reasoning, it's a conclusion of how did that evidence support the claim that you made. And this next one is quite similar to that, claim support and question. So the first two parts are still claim and support. This will be in French. I did this one in English. So and this was an infographic about French people and their cell phones. So the claim, I had three choices of claims for that one. And um, you can see there, I picked the middle one, which was many French people are addicted to their cell phones and then support. So those were just details from the infographic that supported that. And then a question at the end. And I think really the questions that students ask tell us a, lo a lot about what they understood from, th from the text. The next one, fiction in the facts. So this the students have a text and three statements and two of those will be true and one will be false. So then we're just asking the students to explain which one is false and to support um, to support their answer by saying why two of them are true and why one was false. Um, and the last interpretive task that I'm including today is called the compass point thinking routine. So if we can set it up like a compass because there's an E, a W, an S, N, and an S. But instead of east, west, north, and south, we have for the E, what excites you about the idea? For the W is what worries you about the idea? What N? The N is what you need to know, and the S is what is your stance on the idea. So um, for an idea, this was an article about filters that are on Snapchat and Instagram and the effects that those can have on, on kids and their mental health. So what excites, so my um, kind of proposition that I started with is you've heard that Instagram and Snapchat are going to eliminate their photo filters. So for what excites you, it could be, um, could be a good thing, right? You're excited because the filters cause a lot of damage. Some kids end up losing contact with their actual parents and resort to plastic surgery. So that's a fact that was given in the article. What worries you about the idea that they could be given up is that my friends and I like to use the filters, seeing stars like Ariana Grande and the Kardashians on social media, or that I like seeing them. I'm worried they won't post if they can't have a filter. Um, what I need to know is how can I help my friends that have Snapchat dysmorphia, which is something that they talked about in the article, and our stance. So all in all, I think it's a good idea. I'm willing to give them up if they can help, if that can help other people. So again, students would have all different um, responses for that that uh, graphic organizer. So that's our first mission, right? I hope now that you feel like you have a quite uh, an arsenal of different interpretive tests that you could use as you're designing your unit. Lots of variety makes it more interesting for our students. And I think that different tasks are better for different types of authentic resources that you would choose. So now that, now that your students have interpreted whatever authentic resource that you've chosen at, certain, at whatever point in your unit, what's gonna be next? right? We're not done when they interpret it, but we want to make sure that whenever possible that leads into an interpersonal task. So we're going to look at some ideas for those for our mission too. But a quick reminder that interpersonal is that active negotiation of meaning. So it's spontaneous. If the students know in advance what they're going to say, then it wasn't interpersonal. So we will look at, as we look at those, keep that in mind. So this first one, cross, pair crossword puzzle is super. Um, my students really love this. And if you're kind of need some directions later about how to make it, there's a link there with some directions of how to make it. But you simply make a crossword puzzle but you fill in for, so there's a partner A variety and a partner B variety. Um, 
example, and the partner A has the horizontals filled in and partner B has the vertical answers filled in, but need, there's no clues anywhere because this is a activity that involves circumlocution and the students are going to give the clues. So if start, partner B started, you can see they have one down is Twitter. So maybe they would say in the target language, oh, this is a social media that has a, a limit of 160 characters. So there's, their partner could figure out that that was Twitter and fill, fill in Twitter on number one. Um, speed friending is another activity that I think is, is used by a lot of teachers. Um, sometimes people call it speed dating. I just like to call it speed friending. But the students have a list of questions. We'll kind of look at that. So in this sample, a student has written these questions that they're going to ask their classmates. So do you sleep with your cell phone? I think I gave them the prompt here is which, which student in our class is the most addicted to their phone? So these were some questions that they could, have, could ask. Now, if I'm using this with novices, so if you're teaching a category three or four language where your students at checkpoint B might still be in that novice range, a lot of times in that case, I would have this, I would give the students a whole bunch of questions, you know, maybe a dozen or 15, 20, and I would have them select the questions because at that level, we're not really expecting them to be able to make their own questions yet. But how I set this up when I'm using it with my students is I divide the class into two rows facing each other. And they start with whoever's sitting or standing in front of them, ask their questions, record their answers. And then after two minutes or however much time they needed, they would switch. One, one row would each move to the right and they would ask the same questions as someone else. So it's great practice with questions, but it still has that interpersonal component because they don't know which question they're gonna hear. Another um, act interpersonal activity that's this is pretty guided still is that um, it's called the yes because. So in this case, it's, the teacher will give the student some statements, and the partner your each each partner will have these statements, and they'll take turns asking. So you know, partner A, if if your statement was Facebook is is a very popular social media, partner B is going to always answer yes because. So they're just um, adding more detail to their to their response. So they're supporting that response. So yes because two billion people are on it. Um, yes because. I know so many people that are, you know, it's so easy to use or yes, because it was the first social media that many people had, whatever the answer. So then maybe the next question would be partner B would have it. Oh, you should never, your never share your password. Partner A would answer yes, because you could get hacked. Next one is called bracketology, and I really like this one for getting lots and lots of speaking done. So this is set up like a sweet 16 kind of bracket, right? So in this case, you know, I, you're going to have a question every time. So in this, in this case, my question up there was, what is the best social media? What's the best social media? So the students would be in small groups, and they would have in each case or two that they, they're going to choose you know, first they would discuss of these two, which is better. So is Facebook or Twitter better? And as a group, they would discuss that over and over again, or not over and over, but they would discuss it until they reached a consensus about which of those two is better. And they would put that in the second column. Then they would talk about in Instagram and Pinterest and put the winner in this, right, in this spot. Then they would talk about TikTok and YouTube and put it in this spot and then Snapchat and WhatsApp there. Okay, then you, so you've gone from eight to four, like, just like a sweet 16. And then, of course, there's only eight. Um, so then they would start over with, you know, these two winners would go there until in the end, every group had what they felt was, you know, the best social media. But of course, every group would be different. Um, this next activity came from my uh, desire to be able to use more text because my 
you know, one of my very favorite parts of unit planning is compiling and uh, curating those authentic resources. And I usually found that I had more authentic resources than I could actually use in a lesson. So I came up with this activity because I could use two. So we can look at what that looks like. So this is a partner A paper. So they have a text of some sort and they have some statements. And for um, intermediate, low and mid students, I would keep these statements in English because I want them to have to create the questions into that negotiate meaning in that way. So even though it says the number of Pinterest boards, the question they would ask is, how many Pinterest boards are there? So you'll see that the text they have doesn't have anything about Pinterest, right? Because that is on their partner's paper. So their partner has a different text and different questions. And of course, the answer to these questions or these statements are on their partner's paper. So they're just asking each other questions that will be answered by their partner I call it an interpretive interview, interview because their partner has to be able to interpret their text in order to answer the questions. Um, another type of, because we talked about texts like ads or PSAs, we're, I found some great um, PSAs related to this, this um, topic of social media and like using cell phones. So these were questions I thought that would be good for guiding that kind of conversation. So. What do you see in this ad? What product service campaign or organization is it for? How do you know, is it effective? So just some kind of guiding questions. And these are some examples of some PSA. So these were of course about uh, using your cell phone in the car. Um, this next one is called hexa hexagonal thinking. And that was um, of course, um, it's shaped like hexagons. So we'll look at what that looks like. In this case, so the students are gonna have a whole bunch of hexagons and they're gonna discuss, and each has a key word or idea from the unit or from a text that they've been studying. And they're gonna make connections. They're gonna discuss connections between the ideas and then use those to link the words together. Now, in this case, I used Google, I, um, I, I did this on Google Slides and they could dr drag and drop these hexagons but you could also do it as a manipulative if your students are face-to-face -face and touching things at this point, um, then you could do this as a manipulative. But I just dragged and dropped like the word TikTok and the word share. And as a student, I would say, well, TikTok is a social media where people share content. And in, in fact, I also was able to drag over the word videos and connect that to TikTok because TikTok has videos, but also to share because you share videos. So I could then drag, I could drag Facebook. Face, Facebook could connect. So because a hexagon has six sides, you can make up to six connections for every word. But of course, not every word will connect to six others. But everybody's, um, everybody's every group's um, hexagon diagram would look a little bit different. And it keeps changing as the students discuss. So then the next one is chat stations. I think a lot of people use chat stations and this just means that there'll be prompts around the room um, and the students as a small group visit the prompts. And I like to do some guiding questions to get the students started, but with the understanding that they will create more, more um, conversation, they'll add to those as they're talking. So in this case, it's gonna be pictures of like cartoons and memes that are the prompts. And they might talk about you know, who are the people in the cartoon? What's happening? What's the message? How are irony, exaggeration, symbolism used? Do you agree with the message? Why or why not? So I would, you know, if possible, I would just, you know, I'd have these on big papers and post them around the room and students would be in a group and every couple of minutes they would, you know, they would move, um, circulate around the room with their group. But also if you're not face-to-face um, -face with your students, these could be in a slideshow. And now this next one is an in interpersonal writing. We've talked about a lot of interpersonal speaking, but of course, interpersonal writing also uh, exists out there. And this one is really great. It's great for a preparation if you might be doing some kind of debate in class, um, but it it's, can be great even if you're not. So for this, everybody has this diagram. Um, and in box number one, they give their opinion. So my, my question there or my proposition was Snapchat should be banned. So 
this for the spot number one, the students give their opinion and explain their reasons. So this made up kid says, I agree because many people use it for sending inappropriate pictures and it's hard to hold them accountable because the pictures disappear. So then the students switch paper. So pass your paper to the person sitting to your right. Now this new person has the paper, they read what the first student said, whoever filled out box one, and then their directions are to support their opinion with different with additional ideas to so support person number one's opinion. So they're not writing their own opinion, they're supporting whatever that was. And I think that's really um, good for students to be able to support an opinion, even if it's not there, especially if they're going to be doing debates. So they supported, the student supported by saying, also some people use Snapchat for criminal activity or sharing false information in hate speech. So then gonna switch papers again, to give it to somebody that hasn't had it yet. And it says to add an opposing argument to that that's given in number one and two. So an opposing argument could be, it's not necessary to ban Snapchat because it will shut down your account and report you if you send inappropriate pictures. Also, I like using Snapchat because it's a way to keep in, keep in touch with my friends. Again, now one more time, you're going to pass your paper to somebody else and whoever gets your paper at this point says, are they going to read the first three answers and then give their own opinion and reason to support it. So in this case, even though I use it, I wouldn't really mind if I got banned, somebody I know got harassed and I felt really bad about it. So that was interpersonal writing. And then there's one more interpersonal. This is back to a speaking test, but I think that this can be used in a lot of different ways. And this one's called barometer. And the students, you start with some kind of statement, controversial statement, such as the, the American government should ban social media. So then the students line up in a continuum based on their, their position regarding that prompt. So if they 100% agree, I would usually say you're going to stand closest to me and I stand in front of the classroom. And if they're totally disagree, then I say you're at the very back of the line. And then the students have to talk to each other to decide where they fit in the line. But this really leads to some great conversations because how, you know, what questions you have to ask to find out if you're a little bit ahead of somebody or a little behind them. So this is a conversation that can really go on. And if, if you're still with maybe some novice students, novice high, I would use just a very concrete question. I've had them line up according to their birthdays, right? So that's still like lots of great practice. When's your birthday? They have to understand the month and the day, those numbers, if their birthday is a little before or a little after. Um, the plus one routine is just a note taking. So it's going to be another interpretive, I mean, interpersonal writing activity. So the students read a text or watch a video and then they, they take, um, then they take some notes, but we tell them not to be able to look at, don't look at any notes that you took as you were reading or listening. You're just going to focus on the reading or listening and then close the text or turn off the video and just write down the main ideas that you remember. Then, so you have your paper with your main ideas and then you pass that to someone else in your group. Um, and that person reads what you wrote and then they add an idea of their own. So either a new idea, they elaborate on something you said, or they make some kind of connection to something that you said. So this way, and then you repeat that process a couple of times. So that really is reinforcing the content because everybody is reading what their classmates put, what their other classmates added to it. And it's great, you know, interpersonal writing for that. Another great mix of interpretive and interpersonal is the 4 to one strategy. And for this one, students read a text and generate the four most um, important ideas, what they think are the most important ideas from a text. Then they pair up with a partner and share their ideas. Um, and together they have to agree on the two most important uh, ideas from the text. Then that those four students join up another four um, and they agree on what the single most important idea was from the text. So that's lots of great communication that happens there. So that's our second mission, right? So now hopefully you have a lot of um, ideas for some interpersonal tasks that you could use with your students in designing your unit. So you have some interpretive tasks and some follow-up interpersonal tasks.
that you could use. So then we just have our one next last mode of communication to talk about, which is our presentational tasks. So remember that presentational communication is a creation of messages. It's one way um, intended to facilitate interpretation by members of the other culture. So it's writing, speaking, or visually presenting. I usually think about those in terms of a raft activity. So that's just kind of how I um, create a context for my presentational. So when you have a raft, the R means the role. So what role do, or will the st students be taking as they write you know, or speak? So maybe their role is that they're themselves or themselves as an exchange student, a host student, an employee, a character in a story, subject of a news article, etc. Um, who is their audience, which could be themselves, like if they're writing a journal entry, their audience would just be themselves. Um, are they a member of the host family? So if they have a host student staying with them, um, are they a keypad or sorry, I'm sorry, this is their audience. So are they writing to themselves in a journal? Are they writing to a member of their host, their host family or speaking, preparing a, a spoken message for a member of their host family? Are they writing to a keypad? Are they writing a blog? So their audience is their readers. Are they, is their audience a character in the story? If you're having a conversation between two characters in a story, um, is that are you writing to a subject in a news article? Just some different ideas. And then the F in raft is for the format. So different formats that a presentational writing could take or a presentational speaking could be a journal, an email, a blog, a text, a tweet, a letter, an article, an op-ed, an obituary, to-do list, a script, brochure, interview, comic strip, infographic, film, music, restaurant review, speech, advertisement just to name a few. And then of course the topic and the topic is going to come from whatever, you know, whatever they were, what your interpretive task was and, you know, whatever authentic resource that they were reading or listening to and discussing. So some examples that you might have um, are that some examples that I came up with for this sample unit that I have would be the first one, you know, these are examples of presentational tasks. So there was the song about the singer was singing about social media and we looked at that as those verses of the song. So it could be a message, one of his children. And in the music video, you see him kind of ignoring his children to be on social media. So it could be a message from one of his children asking them to asking him to reduce his time on social media. Um, it could be uh, another one. We didn't really look at this at the document in the um, during the unit, but this was about people in Senegal and their social media in Senegal. So um, the idea that I had is that maybe you would write a blog post about the role of social media from the point of view of a teenager from Senegal, because there were infographics in that article uh, about the use of social media in Senegal. But you would be writing from the point of view of a teenager from Senegal who has recently moved to France. So that way there would be that great cultural comparison that, you, that would be included in that. You could also write a note to record a video, like if you, if you use Flipgrid maybe, um, to your Francophone key pal, asking them to follow you on your favorite social media and explaining why. So that might be a great follow-up presentational task after they did that bracketology activity. Um, there was going, there were some articles about online safety. So maybe you would write the script for a poster for your school library, you know, you could frame that is we have exchange students coming. So we want to have that poster for them. Congratulations, Michigan, Michigan, <laughs> can you tell them from Michigan? Mission accomplished. There you have the, your students, they're interpreting texts, they're having great discussions, they're presenting information to each other as a result of all of these different types of tasks that, that you've learned about. So if we review what our can-dos were for today, I can curate appropriate authentic resources for checkpoint B, I can design those interpretive tasks, interpersonal tasks, presentational tasks, and 
I think we are going to have some time for some questions, right? And the link there would be to the actual Google presentation that we're looking at. And there's my email if you would like to contact me. Do we have some questions? Thank you so, so much, Lisa. Oh, go ahead, Joanne. No, I was going to say Lori's going to start with the first question. Yes. Thank you. Um, so many great ideas. Uh, lots and lots of questions about your authentic resources, but one that jumped out at the beginning from Sheila um, was one that I've had for a long time as well, um, specifically about presenting infographics to students. As you know, many of them are these just wonderfully long jobbies that are difficult to manipulate either digitally or printing them. So her question was, um, how do you present them to students without having to kind of chop them up and parse them in weird ways? Right. So what I do is I use screenshots. So I use the, um, you know, you know the, the little scissor tool, whatever that's called. So that I have in my computer. And I just like pick, you know, a box. Usually infographics are made up of dif different boxes or some part. So I just, you know, screenshot, snip snipping tool. I just snip part of it and put it on a dock and then snip it, snip another part. And yes, it might be more than one page, but that way I can make it big enough that the students can see it on paper. And then whether I share that as a Google Doc and they read it that way or I share it on paper, but that's what I do so that they can read it, they can write on it if they need to. That's great. Thank you so much. Sure. Do we have other questions? Joanne, Bill, did you pick up any? I know there were a few questions about uh, authentic materials. I think really a key, and I think I kind of saw in the chat um, that somebody, someone mentioned Leslie Grant's Pinterest page, and hers are awesome, 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 awesome. Um, you can look my name up on Pinterest. I do have, I mean, I have lots of boards with French resources, but also because of my work with teachers around the country, I also have boards for other languages, just as a place to kind of start out. But what I really think is great about Pinterest is that you know, I recommend that people make a board with each topic or each, you know, each unit topic that they teach. And then as things, sh as things show up on your feed, you can stick them there. So that's the first thing then when you're starting to create a new unit or revise a unit you've used before is everything's right there. And if you know, I just find if I just start with those authentic resources, I get, you know, that that lets me know where I want to go with that unit. So definitely you want to follow people. And the thing about authentic resources is that sometimes you don't always know what you're looking for until some other awesome teacher finds it and pins it. And then like, oh, that's what I need for this unit. So I really highly recommend that. I know for French teachers too, AATF, Catherine Usalan does so much work with this. And there's a AATF Wakelet and YouTube channels. And she's done lots. She works really hard to curate for people. Bill, I know you're monitoring the chat. What yeah. other questions do you have? We have? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. A question about grading, like which parts of these uh, tasks might you grade and how do you do that? And how, how long does this unit, would the, a unit like this take you? So I generally say that a unit would be four to six weeks. So, you know, you would just, depending on, you know, that would kind of guide with how many authentic resources you could do. A, a lesson that has an interpretive task, interpersonal task, and presentational task, usually I would say it would be about 90 minutes. Like in a block, I could probably do all three tasks, um, if, but with a more traditional class period of 45 or 50 minutes, it might kind of bleed over to the next day. So some people call this a um, everyday IPA. Um, when I first started designing lessons in this way, uh, Amy Leonard called it an authentic lesson cycle. But I just like to use that cycle that replicates the order on an IPA, an integrated performance assessment, starting with the interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational task. But back to the question about grading. Um, you know, I think don't grade everything. The students don't need to know what you're going to grade and not grade. For the interpersonal task, even though there are things that they're writing down, um, 
the, all the for me if i'm grading interpersonal that's just i'm just walking around the room and i recommend that you would walk around the room the whole time during all those tasks i like to have a clipboard with a class roster and would just write little notes give verbal feedback um and you know once in a blue moon maybe something made it to my grade book from that but basically it's just giving the students feedback and that's what i think for most of these these are all formative tasks so you know depending on what your school districts uh philosophy is about grading as you might not need to write anything down for many of these it just depends but certainly you can use a very simple rubric for the interpretive task you know a lot of those were graphic organizers so you could just do you know a 10 point scale or wow they completed it in lots of details with you know accurate language could be a 10 and you can decide on descriptors on down but I would not spend a lot of time grading. Spend your time creating these these um, opportunities for the students to use the language. Great, thanks, Lisa. Um, sure. and one more question about sure. um, uh, the use of English. There was one activity you talked about uh, giving them the prompts in English, and then they did the questions in the target language. Um, what you want to talk about? Some other times you might use choose to use English and within the context of these activities? So yeah, and it really depends on the proficiency level. And because I was talking about checkpoint B, I think that they could do most of it in the target language. But I do think sometimes, especially for an assessment, you know, for people that use the IPA template, um, from summative assessment is a lot of that is in English. And I do think if you are interpreting a text, often the, the clearest, un, the clearest, understanding of how much they understood is sometimes to have some English. It is not direct translation, but, um, you know, giving explanations in English. And part of that is sometimes it's really hard to write questions in the target language that don't use the vocabulary from the text. And as soon as you do that, as soon as your true and false question has nine of the same 10 words that are in the text, you're not assessing anything other than their ability to pick out the same word. So if you can, once they're at a certain level, you can use cognates or um, other forms of a word and you can write questions, but sometimes that's pretty hard. Um, so if you can write questions in the target language, which don't use the same words, I would say definitely do it in the target language by the time they're at this intermediate level. Great, thanks. One more thing I'll ask about is um, I, uh, uh, you had a great comment uh, who loved your hats idea. Can't wait to try the hats idea. I, I, I dug that one too. I thought that was great. And what an, what an activity that kind of differentiates itself within right. the, within the group. I mean, you can look at those tasks and, um, you know, and you can kind of target which kids, some kids are, some are more challenging than others. And the kids will even self differentiate in a way in the group. That's, that was a I like that. Great. And I will. Well, thank you. And I will just add, um, I'm a better curator than I am a creator. So really, mo the vast majority of those are not mine, but I did put the source on each slide. So I would definitely let it's uh, Mr. Bono who came up with those the hats. But yeah, I w was not exposed to that until quite late in my career. But I, yeah, I thought it was awesome, too. So <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Joanne. You want to pick it up from here? Yeah, I was going to say in follow up to talking about the hats idea uh, activity, someone asked, would individual students each have a hat or might that be groups or pairs of students? What might that look like? Uh, so what it looked like for me was that I tried to do put them in groups of four or five and give everybody in that group a different hat. But also I could see that as being an awesome jigsaw jigsaw type of activity where they read, you know, and you had, you know, the red group and the white group and the gray group and sure to during the interpretive phase and then they could come back and talk about it, you know, wearing their hat with with the mixed group that would I think work great also. Okay, at this point, I don't see any other questions. So if there's anyone who has a last minute burning question, you can throw it in the chat now. And if um, you come up with them more later, please also reach out to me with that email there. 
Um, so we're being asked about sharing the PowerPoint. Bill will put the link in the chat again. And as Candy mentioned earlier, when you get your email tomorrow, she'll also have a link to the folder that will contain a PDF of the presentation. All right, so you'll get the PDF, and but then also if you want to be able to click on any of the slides to the hyperlinks I've included, there's also a link to the Google. Okay, and there's a great deal of gratitude for everything you've shared today and gratitude from our team. We really appreciate the way in which everything you presented today really reinforces the many ideas that we have been sharing with our colleagues around New York State over the last many months and setting them up for success. Awesome. Great. Well, I've been so thrilled with the work that you've done and really enjoyed um, digging into all those resources in preparation for today. Lisa, I want to thank you for a wonderful workshop and thanks to all the staff who helped facilitate this event. A reminder that all attendees will receive either a certificate of attendance or a CTLE certificate within 24 hours. You're also going to get a workshop badge for this workshop. When you receive your badge, consider adding it to your email signature or posting it to social media to spread the word about world language professional learning. The recording of this workshop and the accompanying post assessments will be made available on the OBEWL professional learning website within about a week from today. A reminder that the registration form for the final workshop on December 7th, which is unit planning part four, checkpoint C with Regina O'Neill is open. And please consider bookmarking our professional learning page so that you can keep up to date with our new offerings, including five exciting workshops for the 2022 school year. I wanna thank you again for attending and have a wonderful week.